<laughs> okay, welcome to our TTT. Today's presentation will be given by Peter. It's going to be about learning, learning cardinalities, estimating correlated joints with the Oh, Peter? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I've uh, probably not trained for this presentation. But um, this is a paper that was presented at CIDR 2019. So for everybody who was not at CIDR 2019, uh, Stefan was there. Yeah. He was not there. Oh, Martin was there. Oh, and Martin and uh, Yeni were there. Yes. yes. Well, okay. So, so well, then it's, it's the first time you will hear about this. Probably, maybe you haven't even read the paper already. That's possible. Uh, anyway, so this is work together with Andreas Kip. He is a um, PhD student at the TU Munich, but he's also involved in his brother, Thomas Kip, who works for Max Welling across the road uh, in the, uh, well, the uh, machine learning group of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and then uh, Bernard Raad, here's Victor Leis, who gave the original presentation and who made the slides, I must confess, and me and Alphonse Kemper. Uh, okay, so this is about deep learning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> deep learning, <laughs> really. Um, so yeah, this is of course the most fashionable and hyped topic. I think graphs are definitely out. They are not number one anymore, I'm sorry. They are number two still. But machine learning and databases by now is the most, the most fashionable topic uh, that's around. And you know, I'm also fashionable. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also have a paper on, uh, on deep learning and, uh, and databases. Okay. Um, okay, so now, I mean, the, the utmost goal, maybe, that actually is being proposed, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding, is, uh, okay, so how can we combine, you know, machine learning and database systems? So why not replace the entire database system by, 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 by TensorFlow, you know? So you just type your query and outcome answers, you know, what about that? I, I think that's ridiculous, but I'm a minority, maybe by now in the field. So, so there is definitely people trying to do this. Um, <coughs> okay, would involve, of course, not only training for queries, you would have to show lots of queries, but you would also have to train those queries on the data that you actually want your answers to be about. So it is going to be um, yeah, challenging, I would say, but um, who knows? We don't believe in that. Uh, well, one of the biggest, um, challenges in database systems is still query optimization. And uh, uh, so it is not such a, uh, a strange idea maybe to think, okay, the things that we cannot do yet so well, maybe we should try machine learning for that. Maybe we can then do things that we were not able to crack before. Uh, and so one idea here is that <coughs> we cannot really do query evaluation, try to do it with TensorFlow, but we at least try to find, well, solve this problem with problem of finding a good query plan, you know, with a query optimization problem. So that would entail, okay, training a deep learning model to well, indeed read in a query and then output a physical uh, plan. Okay, well, personally, I think this is also still a very, very tall order because, um, okay, it would also involve training a lot of queries on a particular data set, of course. Um, <laughs> sorry, Stefan. Yeah, sorry. I have to stand up. Um, um, yeah, it would also. I mean, the, the, the reason why it is it is quite uh, difficult is that not only would would you have to train a lot of queries, but you would also have to consider possibly well the entire space of um, of query plans, which are many, of course, and uh, you have, for instance, in a query plan, you can can have the same operators, but can also have them in various orders. Um, so, uh, and then um, the operators, if you think about relational operators, you also have um, a translation from logical operators like join to the various physical variants like merge joint, S join, uh, what have you join. Um, so these two, like the shapes, the orders, and the physical operators, they add, well, they add a lot of, 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 of space, like search space. The search space is really huge. And, um, well, you would probably have to show a lot of training samples before before you would be able to do this. Yet, there are actually signal papers about this. So, no, also, and there were cyber papers also about this, trying to do this. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so what this paper was about is, or is about, is a still more modest or less ridiculous, ambitious uh, 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 approach to say, okay, we're not going to try to um, create a plan, but we're just going to, going to confine ourselves to the problem, the sub-problem of cardinality estimation. Well, that is one of the of the of the of the of the um, kind of modules that you have in a query optimizer. In the query optimizer, you have um, well, actually, I have uh, probably in the next slide. You have these um, three main modules. So you have plan space enumeration. <coughs> that is basically where this whole large search phase comes from. You've got a cost model that can tell you, uh, well, that can predict rather rather what a uh, what the cost would be of, a, of each such individual plan that you might that might, that you might search in plan space. Um, but that cost model takes as input typically some some quantities like how many tuples are going to flow through these operators, and these quantities are predicted by the by cardinality estimation. And people are, have been using various techniques for these, like histograms or or um, samples in fact <coughs> anyway so we only focus on one of the three boxes um, uh, okay um, so I already said there were uh, there are there are very many papers trying to address or trying to integrate machine learning and database system actually there is going to be in Sigma a workshop called AIDM which stands for something like using artificial intelligence in data management. So that workshop is entirely dedicated to uh, adding more uh, bullet points to this uh, slide. <laughs> 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 so because obviously you can try to use AI in various, um, in all kinds of areas in a database system. So there was like this recent paper about automatic not queuing, like database systems have lots of configuration options. You need the database administrator to, uh, well, often, well, people often need the database administrator to, well, to find the best settings for your particular workload. So I did there is, okay, you don't need a database administrator anymore. You have a, a, a deep learning model that will actually learn what the settings are. And now there was also this uh, well-known um, hype paper about learned indexes that said, uh, well, uh, one important part of database storage is actually uh, indexing like D-trees. Uh, we don't need that anymore. Uh, use a TensorFlow model, uh, and that was proposed by this by Tim Kraska uh, and with the, and his co-author Jeff Dean, not to be forgotten, um, at the previous segment. <coughs> well, there are some, some issues with that, but okay, we're not going to there. Um, so I would like to kind of update these things and there. Reliability is, is to be questioned. And indeed, there were also uh, already um, in this previous conference, but also in the current conference, this uh, approach of doing the second approach, like trying to do the query optimization problem directly. Hmm? Get, get physical query plans, and there are multiple proposals for that. Okay, so, uh, but we focused on only cardinality estimation. <coughs> and the reason for that is that we consider that Plan space enumeration is in fact kind of a solved solved problem. Um, there have been uh, there have been a lot of research on that, you know. And uh, what well, the latest and greatest in that is this uh, is this paper that extends um, bottom up query enumeration to be more robust against uh, very large query plans. Well, so Victor Weiss uh, and Radke actually they happily proclaim that this is the the solution to the problem, but I would at least say it is a, a good solution to the problem. So this problem is relatively under control. Uh, we also have this uh, well, this um, uh, Field of B uh, paper, and later Field of B journal paper about how good are query uh, optimizers anyway, which uh, produced these graphs that you see there. Now for those who recognize them, you know what's there, for those who don't, or well, it did lots of experiments on um, a workload that is actually quite hard for query optimizers. It was a, it's a workload based on the uh, Internet Movie Database that has lots of correlations. Correlations is a complication for query optimizers. Um, okay, so but what you see in those graphs is that uh, actually 
the three horizontal, the three horizontal um, uh, compartments there, they test different uh, cost models. Mm -hmm. Well, basically on the left side you've got bad estimates, the situation with bad cardinality estimates. On the right side you've got correct cardinality estimates. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you and then because cardinality estimates of course not everything you have to feed them into a cost model to know how how what the cost of the period of time will be. The message of that picture is actually doesn't really matter so much what cost model you give. Now the the very very simplest cost model that says add all cardinalities together in the period plan is performing quite well. And you can make it more complex by saying I'm going to model, you know, the cost of a, of an IO of an IO and the cost of a, of a cache miss, and I'm going to try to model the cost of the, the CPU uh, complexity of a hash join versus a merge join. Sure, you can sometimes make um, a more accurate prediction, but you also very often make the prediction more more fragile and. Um, on the, on the whole lot, it actually doesn't matter very much because if you have bad estimates to start with, you will produce garbage. You know, garbage in means garbage out, whatever the cost model will say. Therefore, also, we would say that, well, cost modeling maybe doesn't matter actually so much. So the thing that's really hard and that really matters a lot in query optimization is cardinality estimation. And cardinality estimation, <coughs> uh, yeah, it gets it wrong. So here you see, again, pictures from that VLDB paper, uh, VLDB journal paper, I mentioned the, how, how, uh, how good are Optimizer. query optimizers anyway. And, um, and that, in these graphs you see various systems. Uh, you see them performing on joints on this Internet Movie database with uh, from zero to six joints. Okay, so zero joints is just a selection uh, query essentially. Well, one, two, three, four. But with more joints, you see that the um, prediction gets worse because the the one line is the, the correct the correct estimate. And with ever more joints, you see that uh, and this is an exponential, or this is an, like a log scale of plot. So you see really, really large errors uh, growing with the amount of joints. So yeah, and the reason for that is that um, unlike uh, PPCH which is uniform and does not have any correlations, real data sets actually are quite correlated. Uh, and that means that like, I think there is an example later on, but in, in, in terms of movies, like if you say, if you make a selection on the production company table, and you say this production company is from France, or is always from Paris, for instance, so you make a uh, selection predicate on, on the address of the, uh, company and then you for instance ask for actors born in France which is another selection but a selection in a totally different table so you've got so two tables one you say uh, a Paris production house and on the actors table you say actors born in France and well they are joined together at some point but these two things are actually related you know you will see that in French movies in movies produced by Paris production houses very often French actors uh, play. And the problem is that uh, query optimizers currently, well, they make the independence assumption, but they can't really track um, correlations. There are so many possible correlations that could occur in a schema that it's really not possible to, well, to track them all. There are some attempts to track some correlations within a single table. You know, if you have a table of cars, I mean, if you get a selection on um, the the type of the car and the type of car is Accord, for instance, uh, then we know that the brand must be Honda, kind of, because there is only one, one car manufacturer that makes Accords. So these uh, are like maybe two columns that appear in the same table. There are some techniques, like you can create uh, multi-column histograms to try to capture uh, the correlations between uh, columns inside the same table. Um, you can also use samples and you can, can do that, but as soon as these correlations are in different tables and they are joined together, then all bets are off, you know, and that's what's happening here in these joint queries, that well, the errors start accumulating and every time you join something more, well, you get more error. And that also means that at the end of the query plan, yeah, the, the attitude of errors 
after a few joins. Which means that the decisions and the plans found by these optimizers could be very bad. So it's still an unsolved problem. And the reason for that problem in joins is mostly these correlations. So things do not behave using the independence assumption because optimizers, they typically just use some selectivity vector for a predicate on each table and then they multiply them together. That's the way the, 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 uh, like the join cardinality rate is estimated. Um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so the idea is, okay, this is something that is really hard to solve. So maybe we don't understand it. We don't understand how to do it. So if you don't understand it, we also don't understand machine learning, so that's kind of the connection. So <laughs> we don't understand how it works, why it works. <laughs> so we can try machine learning to this problem. And yeah, this is basically uh, it. Um, okay, so I already talked about correlation, so we'll skip that. Now, um, actually, the, so basically we try to use, well, we try to use uh, deep learning to do this, um, um, yeah, to do these to do these join crossing correlations better. Well, we as database people, we did not have that much of an idea about uh, uh, deep learning. I mean, how to how to set up these networks, how to configure them. But well, Thomas Kip, the brother of Andreas, uh, he did, of course, he is uh, doing a PhD on that. Uh, so one of the things that he had worked with is so-called set-based um, models. Um, so one of the, and, and that kind of matches one problem that people are struggling with, especially the one in the middle box, to try to go to a real plan, because there are many different equivalent plans in a database system, we all know that. You know? So we know that the join of first A and B and then C is the same as the join of A with the join of B and C. Um, but for cardinality estimation, this really doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't because we are not really talking about join ordering. We just want to know what is the how many tuples come out of this join of, of, of the three tables, and no matter how you do it, because they're equivalent, the answer, the number of tuples is the same. So also when we want to train a model, we do not want to show a particular shaped query plan and then train it with a result, because then if you get it maybe a next query and the next query would have a different shape, but it would be equivalent. The, the model still wouldn't have learned anything about that problem. So basically what we want to do is we want to, well, to, to represent these joins as sets. Basically sets of, of tables that have been joined over a known foreign key relationship. That's what we are talking about. So basically <coughs> what, this, what this approach does, it only works on a schema where the joins are over the foreign key relationships. Okay, so that's a restriction, of course, not general joints. And then we are going to uh, kind of train the model on all the combinations of well, foreign key traversals that you can make. Actually, not all of them, we could not do that either. Certainly not if they are circular, then you, then you could have an infinite amount of possible traversals of this schema. Uh, so we're not doing that. This is just done until a limited step. I think three joints, the, the, the model has been trained. Okay, so and then basically we pick um, we represent the join just as a set of tables that have been joined together over over these well already predetermined foreign keys. By the way, assuming in this first limited approach that there is only one foreign key primary key relationship between every two tables, <coughs> you could have multiple ways of going from table A to B. But, well, you can extend this model as well, of course, by naming them differently. Okay, so one idea is this set-based modeling, and you need to uh, use particular uh, uh, deep learning techniques uh, for those. There was some paper called the Deep Sets that talked about this in a uh, well, very different context, not in a database context, but it was also a problem where, uh, where, the, where the input would, uh, is represented as set and the order didn't matter of the, of the, uh, of the features that went into it. By the way, this is called featureization in uh, machine learning. So you, if you want to train something in machine learning, you have to first think a lot about, okay, how am I going to represent my inputs to a deep learning algorithm? And how am I going to, well, what is going to come out? That's all, especially the things that go in, these are called the features, and this process is called featureization. So this, this set-based approach is one featureization idea. The second idea was actually my idea, is um, 
to build on top of sampling. Okay, so because we know, or at least I'm fully convinced, that um, cardinality estimation, the state of the art of that is currently uh, based on samples. Well, and hyperbola maybe, but samples are nice because if you take a table sample, um, in that table sample, you will see correlations. You, you will see only Honda Accords. You will not see uh, Honda 3 series there. So you will, the correlations will also be, be in, the, in that table. So if you basically replay a query on a sample, you get some tuples out maybe, and you can then extrapolate these tuples. That's the basic idea of using sampling for result size estimation. Uh, and that is resistant against correlations inside that table only, not between tables. Uh, so that is why, well, so that is why systems are by now switching to uh, using samples more for cardinality estimation. Um, yeah, and the and the idea here is rather than trying to compete with samples, we can also build with deep learning on top of samples. So we can use, we can assume that. Uh, we will have a database system, and this database system will have statistics, and these statistics will include table samples. And then when a query comes, we can just consult, you know, we can maybe have some predicates, we will execute them on the samples, and we'll obtain some numbers, some estimates, and these numbers could be features that you feed into the model. Like, that would be a simple approach. But a maybe even better approach would be to say, hey, I have a table sample, Table sample may contain like a thousand tuples. So I, one way, the simple way is saying, okay, I run the predicates, the selection predicate, like uh, brand is Honda and type is Accord. It could be a, a query or just the predicates from that query on that on that car table. I run them on the sample. I observe how many how many tuples come out. Okay, there are some Honda Accords. Great. So my estimate is maybe pretty good on that. So I have a number, maybe 2% uh, of the cars is a home accord, who knows, okay? Uh, what you could also do is rather than say 2% is my outcome, is you could take the bit factor, basically saying for every tuple in the sample, true or false, whether that tuple uh, qualifies or not, okay? 2% of the tuples apparently had a true and 98% had a false in that case. But rather than giving just 2% as the feature input, you could also give the whole bit factor as an input. You could see it as a very large number, because then you're not only telling by doing pop count how many tuples were selected, that is that information is still in the feature, but you're also telling which tuples actually were selected. Okay, And thereby you give the model maybe a chance to learn that if particular tuples are selected, and maybe in another tuple some other specific tuples are also selected, then we can uh, maybe um, make a connection between that. You know, like the French actors and the Paris uh, uh, production houses. <coughs> okay. Uh, right. So it basically the idea is to build on top of sampling. So not competing with sampling, we are actually going to add machine learning to a database system that already has samples. But now we are trying to let it do some things that we couldn't do before. Namely, namely learning these join crossing correlations you know basically now estimating what will the effect the effectual join hit rate be now that we know that we on one hand have French actors and the other hand uh, Paris production houses so that's that point another point is here there is a weakness of these sample based approaches namely what happens if you have a very selective predicate and you Execute on the sample and you get zero results. Okay, is the estimate that you, this database system uh, should use is that estimate then zero? Is it really zero then, or maybe it is something small, but it was smaller than the granularity that the well sample really captures. You just didn't have enough sample tuples. And actually, this error between the real answer and zero, if the real answer is not zero, is an infinite infinitely bad estimate really so it's a factor infinite between what you predict and what you uh, and what is the actual so that's actually a really bad problem that sam that sample based approaches have for these highly selective queries um, so
So, uh, <coughs> so there is some hope that maybe, um, maybe also by the magic of machine learning, if the if we actually have we have these samples as input, but if this if it's a zero bit factor, so nothing is selected, there are also some other features that we can still add, and maybe maybe the model can still learn in those cases to say something better than just zero. Maybe, yeah. hopefully. You know, that's also always the case. You know, if humans are deep learning, we just hope that, uh, that we will learn. Um, okay, now there's other problems other than featureization. Well, okay, that's the second bullet. Uh, but the other problem is, okay, how do you get uh, training data? Well, you could say, I will build my machine learning models uh, on the fly. You know, just every time people do queries, uh, we will just observe what comes out and we'll train and just the weights of TensorFlow. You can do that, of course, but you would have to torture the user with, with very, very bad query plans at the start, maybe maybe thousands of them. So that would not be good. So um, there was this cold start problem. How do you first get a reasonable model uh, without having observed the workload? Um, yeah, and exactly also what should the architecture of this machine learning model be? Because that's also some kind of black magic. People are just trying, you know, the amount of layers and the amount of the transformations and the pooling and the, you can do so many things and usually it is just a uh, trial and error currently. <clears throat> so that was also here uh, the case. Okay, so about the cold start problem, what you can do and what we did is uh, to generate synthetic queries using schema information. So the data types and the foreign key constraints and the actual schema, of course the data, so you basically generate, uh, you say, okay, well, these tables are of interest, these are the foreign keys well, that follow from the schema, uh, and um, yeah, and create a query generator that generates lots of, lots of queries, and then you actually execute these queries on the, on the database system and observe uh, what comes out and use that output. Not only the final output, but also these bitmaps, of course, because uh, executing them means Evaluating the predicates on the samples, extracting or seeing which tuple in sample uh, uh, qualifies, uh, constructing the bitmap, feeding them into the network, correcting the output with the final observed cardinality. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, you can uh, do that automatically. <coughs> yeah, I got it. Yeah. Mm, no, I think I this. <laughs> okay, so how does the featureization in the end look like? in? Um, TensorFlow just wants you to input it uh, vectors of doubles. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, a TensorFlow model will just accept numerical double input, preferably normalized between 0, .0 and 1.0. Um, so yeah, somehow we have to cast our join problem into that, you know, so into, into the vectors of doubles between zero and one. Um, <coughs> well, one technique that is often used is so-called one-hold encoding. Okay, if you have a number, then you don't, then the only thing you need to do is maybe normalize it, if you have something numeric. But what if you have something which is not numeric? Maybe I have cities, for instance. Okay, what do people do? They use one-hold encoding. What that means is that, okay, you may have 200 city names in your, whatever, uh, training set. What you can do is you can create a bit vector of 200 uh, yeah, bits, okay? And you set one bit out of those. You know, if given a city, you basically set the bit in the vector that corresponds to that city. So there is one, one, well, one is hold, and the rest is zero. That is kind of the idea of that. Mm -hmm. And then if you need more than 64 uh, bits, then you just smear it out over multiple uh, uh, numbers, you know? This, this way you kind of feed it into the, into the system. Um, so that's one whole encoding. So that's we use to encode tables that join and the predicates on columns. We, all of these need some kind of one whole encoding. <coughs> and then uh, values, like if you say Accord and Honda, okay? You also need to either one hot encode them, or if they are numerical, you can kind of scale them. So, 
Okay, now, well, um, suppose that we have this uh, query, so like star, well, we don't care. We only care about result size estimation, so we just, uh, well, to basically select count star here. Uh, from um, title, the title table and the movie companies label join together. What that would mean is that, um, yeah, so we have to one hot encode the table ID, so the 010 uh, maps to title, the title table, and 001 maps to the movie company's table, table here. Um, and then for every table, we include the vector, the, the bitmap for the de derived from the samples. So every table is not only a table, but also yeah, which tuples or which tuple examples were qualified for it. And then there is a join set that tells which of the joins uh, were active. And this is in fact a set. So it's not one hot encoded. For every join that is active, uh, the bit is one. And for every join that is not active, the bit is zero. Um, and then there are also additional information, some of about the predicates. The predicates, of course, are somehow already encoded in the, the zeros and ones that go into the into the bitmaps. But we additionally also tell the model what predicate was used and what values are used because also because of this zero, this zero sample, this zero selectivity problem. Okay, so because these could all be zero sometimes, so we tell them that this is about production year. So production year is this column one of encoded. Uh, and then there is a comparison function like equality and a range encoded. And then there is, well, here's 2010, that's a number that can be scaled to, uh, to a value between zero and one. So the highest values are close to one and the lowest values of year are close to zero and everything in, well, in scales of linearly in between. Um, okay, you do that for this and you do this for that. Uh, and that is the predicate set, okay? And then this goes into yeah an, uh, an architecture where you really have to you don't have to ask me very hard questions about why it looks like this. What you can see is that this has to do with this deep sets ID. Okay, so where okay we have multiple sets and uh, for every set we have kind of a separate we feed it into a separate forward execution which is then later pulled, okay? Because these models, I, I think, are the same in principle, but we feed them, we feed every set into, well, a copy of the table model and a copy of the join model and a copy of the predicate model, and then combine the outputs with the average pooling, concatenate, I'm not sure what that actually does. And then there is a final kind of integration layer that, um, yeah, that consists of, in this case, two, uh, a linear and uh, a ReLU and a sigmoid transformation. Why these four? Nobody knows. Uh, probably used to work well. Uh, that kind of co that, that kind of combines the signals that come out of here, and then it's it's predicting just the kind of the uh, the amount of tuples that is what is supposed to train, and that's also what we kind of uh, yeah train it on. So we basically uh, backpropagate errors using the real cardinality, and then try to adjust the weights. That is the wonderful uh, lay, uh, world of uh, yeah, neural networks and deep learning. Um, <coughs> okay, the optimization metric that we try to optimize for is, so when we calculate what is the error, so how good is the prediction, uh, is this the Q error, and that the Q error is the factor between the true and the estimated cardinal. So not the absolute difference, but the, the, the factor of difference, which can be infinite if you say zero and uh, uh, it is not zero. Um, and the goal is to minimize QR over the training set. Did that on the IMDB dataset, set. Um, and uh, we evaluate here with synthetic queries only with equality and range predicates. And well, this picture looks pretty nice. Uh, so we see that uh, this uh, MSCN, which is the name of uh, what this model does, uh, well, has, can be trained to have pretty low error, better than positive S, and very close to um, uh, 
uh, a competing approach that uses joint samples. This was a CIDR paper, I think, of two years ago. So the idea is there that you not only have samples on the not only have samples on the uh, on every table, but you also have indexes um, indexes on all the for on all the joints. So you must have index on all the joints. And the idea of that approach is that you the optimizer uses um, sampling to obtain the tuples that qualify a predicate, and then it feeds those tuples into the <coughs> index, a full index, to find the joint partners of those qualifying tuples in the remote table. Okay, maybe samples that down if there are too many of them, too many hits. But in principle, just continue to do that, and then you have like a sample of the hits on the other side, and you continue the process of. A predicate evaluation there on those samples because then you have matching tuples and then maybe there is another predicate like the, uh, the production house um, you know that should be in Paris and you try that and then you will discover also these correlations the problem with yeah with this approach is that you require um, that you require the presence of indexes on all point of view um, relationships actually bidirectional relationships you really want to use this and that's quite a heavy burden, but it's also quite accurate. Okay, so um, yeah, the initial results look good. Now there is a caveat here, and that's a caveat for all these nice machine learning papers. I can very easily deceive you. I just showed you one, one slide here that said, oh, it's good. <laughs> Do you really believe me? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself, you know? <laughs> so the question is, um, okay, in this case, Okay, we did not we did not trick you. I mean, we were training it on queries, on different queries than we were evaluating it on. So we did not uh, you know, any, do any really bad things. But the question is, if in real life, you know, you can, if the things that people are going to do, how well will they be really be represented by maybe the synthetic uh, training that you did before? And of course, you can learn on the job, but well, then it's if the things that people do are really, really very different, I still want the right. Another weakness of this model was that we trained it for <coughs> up to two joints, so up to three tables, path lengths. Okay, this is quite limited. And there is also uh, a section in this paper that says, okay, um, even though we can only predict joint paths of maximally length two, two joints, you could kind of combine them, you know, by um, by stitching together these paths, and then you can do queries with more joints. But in the paper, you can already see that the error of that uh, becomes well much worse than what we see there. It's not on this slide, so I wouldn't say that this generally solves the problem, but it gives some indication that, um, yeah, that. Uh, that you can actually, um, that you can actually, for instance, beat this. Um, the competitors, also the sampling-based competitors, not here, but the, not not IV joint sampling, but the standard table at a time sampling, uh, be, uh, because well, you have some more handle to 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 say something if if you get zero zero triples out of that. Okay, okay so there are some. In, I would only say that this gives you some indications that this may be. That's the right hammer, that machine learning might be the right hammer. It is a very difficult problem, uh, this, this problem of uh, correlated joints. There is really no hope to create specific, explicit statistics that would capture all possible correlations between predicates on a complex joint schema. So in a way, it's defensible to say, to throw like we do our hands up and say, okay, we don't understand it, but we just hope that the machine learning model will. Be able to learn something here. This, that's essentially what we are saying. Um, um, but yeah, um, and there are also still many questions. And some open questions are: Okay, what happens with complex predicates? Well, we do not represent complex predicates in the one-hot encoding. It just supports equality and range. Uh, of course, the nice thing about the bitmaps is that whatever the predicate is, so even if it's a like predicate or even if it's a UDF, you could still execute the UDF for a like on the sample and you will get a, yeah, 
a vector or a bitmap of qualifying and non-qualifying tuples out. So that approach in principle is quite detailed and it works for all predicates, but it does not work if the, if the bitmap is all zero. Then you still have no information. You know, then if it's a very selective, complex predicate, you still don't have any information and this, inf this approach also doesn't help. Um, yeah, I suggest that and we are <coughs> trying to look into <coughs> not only getting the um, cardinality estimate out, because now we get a number out of the model, but what I would like to get out is I would like it to give back bitmaps of the, um, so I would like to, to train to predict which tuples in the samples of the use tables are in the end participating in the result. So I would like, and or actually not even that, I would like to get representative, it's something more fuzzy. So you, because the problem with uh, join uh, sampling is that, uh, well, the sample of a join is not the same as the join of two samples, okay? And what we have is we have samples and a join of two samples very often is, is empty, you know, because these samples are small and actually the, the likelihood that you get actually two tuples from those samples that actually match is very, well, it's very, very small because a sample of just a thousand, maybe a million of the fact table, so the chance of actually hitting something on the other side in the sample is very low, which means that if you would represent the outcome of a join again as bit maps, then probably they would be empty. Why want, do I want to represent them as bitmaps? Because then I could do this circularly, you know, because if I would know in my result table what tuple would be selected, what tuples would be selected, I could feed them again into the into the model, you know, and then I will, and then I would know the next join. I would have a pretty good estimate of what happens in the next join. And then if I could do this recursively, I could I could you could better solve this problem of doing it on an arbitrary number of joins. But the problem is, is that, uh, yeah, after a join, typically your samples will be zero, your bitmaps will be zero, and then you don't have anything to go by. But the question then is maybe to ask the model to say, uh, which of the, of the tuples in the sample are kind of representative of the, of the population that we get out of the join? <coughs> so which would actually be a good example to continue the, uh, continue the, the, the prediction with? So that is an open question that we are trying to pursue. Another open question that we are also trying to pursue is, um, and actually there's some work that was just submitted, is trying to use this for group by, because group by is also difficult to predict, so the amount of uh, unique values. Um, for that, you could also imagine bringing in not only samples, but also bringing in hyperlog logs because hyperlog logs, statistics you can keep on individual tables, but the question happens is when, what happens after a join, for instance? Can we still do something and predict in group by on top of a join? Um, that is also a totally unsolved problem, by the way. And we get arbitrarily bad results out of any database system uh, if, you, if you do that currently. So yeah, basically it's trying to use deep learning to do these things that we always thought were impossible. And we kind of also, I'm, I'm kind of also skeptical what comes out, but well, sometimes, well, it does appear that the model actually does a better job than just generating random noise, it, it, um, which is what we basically generate now if we, if we feed it into a query optimizer. With that, I think I should stop. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah. Does anyone have a question? Okay, uh, very nice. Uh, one question about the one hot encoding. Mm -hmm. um, so, th this kind of bit vector like encoding, <coughs> is it. I suppose somebody has, uh, has, uh, has looked into this, but the alternative would be to have a dictionary and just use a dictionary ID. Yeah. Um, Which would be a smaller number uh, if you interpret question. a bit vector as, 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 as number. Now we have. For every value, you have a bit vector which has exactly yeah. one bit set, rather than uh, maybe if you sort them, it might be a good idea. Maybe if they're sortable, but but because it's like a continuous input, um, 
I think I think there may be some issues with uh, well, certain dictionaries would be perceived by the model to be very close to each other, uh, where they are not. You know, so but say the one holding card somehow treats I think the zeros and the ones not as a single number but as separate numbers. In fact, it's totally wasteful this extension class. Mm -hmm. So you should not see them as uh, as one number like on fix. I think I said that, but that's not true. I think I think you're right. That's the reason why it's it's, it's, okay, it's actually it's actually model encoding. I think it's just you just have a real uh, tuples. I think there that are zero or one. Yeah. Okay. And then I think the reason is this. Yeah, that that otherwise otherwise you are saying that the two values that are very close to each other in the dictionary are extremely similar to each other. Yeah. Okay. Which may not be what you want the model to learn. Yeah. Probably it's not what mm -hmm. you want the model to learn. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be neighbors of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, also very interesting. Um, I was wondering about the two things, three things. I have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, okay. So the first hey, is yeah. first is you have two tables. You get these big the bit vectors that show you the which yeah. values are selected by the <coughs> predicate, right? And yeah. then you somehow dump that into the model. We dump it into the model, yeah. And then pray and, and pray, yes, yeah. exactly. But I was wondering about about patterns mm -hmm. there because you could imagine that ranges overlap there. Um, in where, where, where do they overlap? Vectors. In these, you have these two selection vectors, right? Yeah. And now the question is, how do they, you know, correspond? There might be overlap. For every table, you just have one. Like yeah. if you have a complex uh, conjunction, yeah. you would I reduce it to so, so. But what do you mean with overlap? I understand that. Now, I mean, you have you get two bit vectors, yes, left and right for different tables. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. And then and then there could be that there's ranges that are one on one side that overlap with ones on the other side in a larger in a sort of a largish way, and there could be the uh, the uh, extreme. Yeah, but there is no. But I mean, there is. I mean, the concept of like comparing them like position by position. I mean, I know that that is bullshit because I know that there is a uniform sample on one table, really randomly ordered tuples from one table. There is a randomly ordered yeah. tuples from other table. What does it even mean to say that the ranges of the two match? Yeah, yeah, but that, that's what I'm wondering. That I would, would be total, total coincidence. Yes, I, I agree. However, yeah. I would wonder whether the model has an easier time uh, de training on larger ranges that match, let's say, than just like you could imagine alternating like one to zero in the worst case. Well, I, mean, I think in general, what these models can do is they can kind of detect patterns. And not only ranges, but any kind of pattern. It could be like that this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. They may be the French actors, you know, match with these, these, and these, which are the, the production houses. Right. And any kind, I mean, that's what the models promise, kind of, that somehow out of this, all this mass of, of data, they will learn these uh, connections. Mm -hmm. So, no matter whether they are allocated in a range. Yeah. Yeah, but that that would be something that has a very difficult time surviving the averaging process that is on top of that, right? So if something is not a very very strong signal in that sense, like my uh, my worst case example with the alternating ones or zero, I would assume that that could completely no, 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 but the, the order doesn't matter because every of those uh, inputs is connected to every of those outputs right. in the end through all those well this explosion of waves. <laughs> okay. So it doesn't really matter where they are in the input uh, position. Okay. But the weights of them, they will be kind of trained. The weights between the ones that are kind of one together, you know, they they will be forming. Kind of. And otherwise, I mean, I really don't know, you know. So somehow this is apparently happening in the in the. It could, could be tested, of course. Well, I mean, in the, I mean, we get this because we see that we can predict that French actors on uh, Paris production houses, this correlated join gets. Yeah, it gets correctly predicted. Yeah, but it might be that all the French actors are next to each other in the table. Um, but they, well, but they were yeah in the sample. Yeah. Uh, but I, again, I, I don't think that I don't think that the the fact that two vectors are immediately adjacent in the array index matters a whole lot. Actually, it doesn't matter anything because they're all connected fully. You know, sure. But. Yeah, uh, my guarantee of this is to the door. Uh, so uh, there, <laughs> I also don't know. But you had more questions. Is anybody else? Yeah. Um, so how large should be a sample so that the model actually learns? Good right? question. Uh, well, you would say the larger the better, okay. but yeah. but the larger the input of the model, 
the longer the time the yeah and the more weights because this is an explosion of weights like everything is connected to everything so this whole matrix gets it's not only one dimension but it's actually multiple dimensions when it gets much bigger so I think we tried with various sizes a uh, thousand and a hundred in the end most of the results are with a hundred even which also makes me doubt you know how, how good could this be you know so how does this work but uh, so yeah I, I honestly think that uh, yeah, when we do sampling for cardinality estimation we usually work with something like a thousand and the reasoning behind that is a bit like okay what kind of granularity of selectivity do you want to predict you know so if you have 10 then you basically can have between 0 and 10 qualifying tuples and you will always estimate like there are just 10 estimates that you can give and if there are 100 you can give 100 estimates if there are a thousand there are a thousand estimates and well you so you basically have three digits of precision and then you say kind of well maybe thousand is enough because of that but that is a reasoning from the world of classical database and using uh, samples for that purpose for the purpose of deep learning actually the training of these models is very fast so actually i think we could we could for the if you have a gpu to train these we could have much much bigger models on the other hand what you also want to do is after you have let's say deployed this the model should continue learning so it actually means that uh, the database system when it's deployed on an arm processor so that would be on the arm processor should still be updating the tensorflow model oh no you don't want dependencies but Mm. Uh, <laughs> should be updating the TensorFlow model probably on the CPU because we are not necessarily wanting to impose that the database server has a GPU so maybe you should be concerned about the computational complexity of the of the model more or maybe we can just use the onboard GPU if there is one just just for the just for the for the query optimizer model maintenance or something like that. And how much time does the, the training? Uh, I mean, on the a training is nothing. Uh, this training is very, very quick here. Okay. So that it tells me, uh, yeah. So it's still. So we could train much more. Actually, there is going to be a demo uh, at Sigmund. So we should ambush Andy and Thomas Kip when they are <laughs> in Amsterdam. And uh, there is actually a nice uh, graphical demo of this stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, you can actually do it live. So then there is some GUI and you can select the tables and the point keys and then predicates and then it will train it for you on the fly. Yeah. Any more questions? No, just a quick one. Uh, yeah. you're, you're saying the training is fast. I'm just wondering if you're taking consideration the actual execution of the queries that you need to execute. To oh, train. yeah, yeah, that is actually not so fast. That's the limiting yeah. factor, actually. Okay. Because yeah. 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 I was thinking about this, and <coughs> it, it's kind of like warming it up. Yeah, take they get into hyper, so it was well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Just a, a size question. So, how large does this model then get with, I mean, with n tables? I mean, is there, is there some. There's one model I take it, right? For all of you. Yeah, I, I would have to look that up. Ah, but, but this model is not, I mean, it's nothing compared to what you use for LXNet for image recognition. It's right. a really a small thingy. So, it, it would also still be generating all those samples from the drawn results of those pre table joins. Yeah. Because that would be my my sort of stupid comparison then to say okay fine we we compute samples on all these three table joins yeah um, so what does that mean really? well we, we run these we run all the three table joins right mm -hmm. we sample from the join result yeah and we use that to estimate the cardinality yeah that would that, that would be yeah that would be actually that's a, that's a competitor that we did not have in but you, that's actually there is a paper on that also of course. Uh, Pusala et al. So they kind of uh, use, um, they create these joints. And just like you say, you basically for all possible joints that you find interesting, you create, you do the join, you create it, you sample it, and then you select, um, you use that to use the selection arm. Right. Um, a, a actually very good question may may hold, totally destroy this paper. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I think I, I suggested it and it was not followed up on and I forgot about it, but yeah, uh, you are totally right. So, uh, yeah. What would this bring over that? Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah.
maybe maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it is, this is I, pro, maybe it's small. This is yeah. yeah. This is yeah. Yeah, I still came up with the question though. If you say the model is not that big, how would you come up with the limit of two joints then? Two joints. Or three joints. Three, uh, not three joints, three joints, three joints. Three joints. Um, maybe laziness, I'm not sure. So uh, we could have done more, of course. You can go on uh, creating more of them, um, training more, should be possible. Yeah. But well, the limitation will still be that you train for a particular path through the schema. Um, there may actually be quite a few paths through the, through the schema. Could be, even if it's not cyclical, if it's cyclical, then obviously the amount of paths is infinite. Uh, if it's not cyclical, I think it still can be an exponential amount of possible joint paths through the schema in the amount of tables, in the worst of cases. Like if you have a fan out of. Uh, yeah. I mean, did you ever try three? I do not know if this was tried, but I can imagine that they did. But I would expect kind of the same result for three. Yeah, it kind of will work for that particular joint that you train it on. The problem is what happens if the joint does not exactly match your trainer's joint hypervalue joint. Yeah. Then the error starts to hit. Any more questions? Did you check if uh, the machine learning uh, estimate was more a correct way for the uh, uh, case where you had zero or yeah, one yeah. or more? Yeah, that is the case. So essentially a query optimizer that's, or a cardinality estimator that uses sampling and sees zero tuples produces yeah. a very, very bad degree yeah. estimate. Um, and this estimate is better. So yeah, because, so it helps. yeah, it helps, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, that's, I mean, if you look in the paper, uh, original joint paper, you see that even the, like the queries without joints, there are errors. And these, so like there is this error bar there. It is not uh, not as big as when there are multiple joints. Uh, but that error bar is mostly caused by, uh, yeah, very, very selective queries. And that error bar goes down with this model. So, yeah. But again, I mean, you're basically improving with something really fuzzy and questionable over no knowledge at all. You know? <laughs> so that is yeah, easy, you know, so that's easy. This, that's because we, we don't really think that machine learning is such an amazing approach. But if you compare it with something for which we do not have any, any good baseline, then it's likely to be uh, better. You know? yeah. And that is the case there. But also for the joint correlations, there is, you know, no information. So you get some arbitrarily bad effect in the in the um, classical joint model query estimation yeah more questions basically finished but your 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 uh, your remark is totally spot on so if you would come back with this pusala paper that was 20 years old and actually do that and compare it with this might very well be that it's the same result which just take away some of the romance here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah.